Hi, folks. Uh, good to see a great group joining us today. Uh, I know it's a stressful time for folks, so I wanted to just start off by taking a, a breath together, like a, a very deliberate uh, in through the nose, out through the mouth breath to calm us down. And it's going to be okay. We're going to work together to to keep doing the work that we do and teaching and learning, whether it's online or, or whenever we turn face to face. So on the count of three, we'll do in through the nose and out through the mouth. Ready? One, two, three. I can, I can only see the panelists, but nice job panelists. Um, welcome to this webinar on social reading, collaborative annotation and remote learning uh, with hypothesis. There's a bit.ly link at the bottom of this uh, slide uh, here. I can, Nate can throw it into the uh, chat, bit.ly slash hype remote. Um, you can get this deck, uh, desk, uh, deck for yourself. There are a number of resources embedded within that are direct links to help you get started in various ways. So I do think it's a useful resource to, to bookmark. I've been thinking over the past few days about uh, this you know, reckoning with this moment that we're in um, losing the ability to, to work face to face with our students. Um, and I came back to a quote from Jennifer Howard in an article in the Chronicle of Education where she, this is very early on when tools like Hypothesis were emerging and she wrote a, an article on, on social reading and there's a great line in it. Online, a book can become a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. And it's that part about the gathering place that I really wanna focus on that I think Texts are a wonderful place to meet with people. Um, that's really why I went uh, myself to get a PhD in English because I loved talking about books with, uh, with students. Um, and uh, that's why I wanted to become a, a college professor. And that's why I've moved into the collaborative annotation business um, is that I think books are a really powerful place to meet. And tools like Hypothesis, uh, social reading collaborative annotation tools make it possible to meet there. Of course, it's wonderful to be face to face uh, with your students in a classroom if you teach in a sort of seminar style. Um, but this is another way to do that, especially in this moment when we, when we can't gather like that. I'm joined today by three really friends, uh, wonderful collaborators and colleagues, uh, Mike Goodsward from Dartmouth, Kat King from Diablo Valley uh, College in, in California, and Amanda LaCastro from Stevenson University in Maryland. Um, these are folks that know a lot about online uh, and blended learning. They're folks that know a lot about uh, annotation and about hypothesis specifically. Uh, they've published about hypothesis. They presented on hypothesis. They have inspired me multiple times in, in the course of our collaboration about what this thing I'm working on, uh, hypothesis and collaboration uh, and collaborative annotation means. Um, so we're gonna hear from them later. I'm gonna try to move through my part of the presentation rather quickly um, so that we can really hear from them and then, and then have a discussion. I do want to shout out to my uh, colleagues at Hypothesis. Uh, it's, I, this is a, Hypothesis is a great mission-driven uh, company with folks that are really focused on the health of the internet and commentary and information on the internet um, and really focused on bringing collaborative annotation uh, to the teaching and learning space now. Um, and my colleague Nate in the upper left-hand corner is, is with us today. And if you work with us, you may encounter other folks here uh, especially Michael De Roberts and Caitlin LeMay, who work with our success team and help schools get uh, up and running hypothesis and help teachers think through how to implement hypothesis in their classrooms. Uh, many have already heard this, but uh, as part of our mission-driven approach to, uh, to, to education and to annotation, uh, we have decided that for the next uh, six months or more, eight months for the rest of the calendar year, we are offering our LMS integration uh, the pilot program, production usage of Hypothesis, uh, all free of charge. So if you're not yet a piloting, your school's not yet a piloting institution, there's no cost involved to, to pilot Hypothesis. Um, and if you are piloting, then you can move to production in the, in the, in the fall uh, without a cost. And this is something we'll, we'll reevaluate as the situation that we're in unfolds. But we really want to make it, uh, we think uh, Hypothesis collaboration can be really valuable as a lot of folks are pushed online that were not there before. Um, I'll talk more about that. And we really wanna make it possible for folks to, to leverage this technology in this, in this moment of need without uh, the monetary obstacle. So part of the way I've been thinking about annotation really forever, but especially uh, more recently, is that annotation is nothing new. And this is what originally attracted me to, uh, to this 
kind of technology. I remember being at a presentation of different learning technologies at, at University of Texas where I got my PhD in English um, and kind of losing my attention uh, through some of the presentations. They were really, really cool stuff like teaching composition through Second Life, uh, sort of a virtual uh, reality game. Not, I guess not virtual reality, but uh, you know, video game way to teach uh, composition. And it didn't, didn't resonate with me, even though I was you know, relatively tech savvy and, and tech curious. Um, but then somebody presented on Digo, a bookmarking and collaborative annotation tool. And it really just hit me. It's a moment I, I remember, and it's you know, obviously turned into nine years of my life working in collaborative annotation technologies. But I remember right then and there saying, seeing, this is a traditional teaching or learning practice that is now moving into the digital age with valuable added affordances. And it just, it just made a lot of sense. And it seemed easy to do and resonant with ways that I had taught previously, but also doing some new stuff, right? By you know, socializing annotation and making, you know, adding, adding these sort of networked and multimedia affordances to um, traditional analog annotation. So for those that are new to teaching online and even blended learning, uh, for those that are new to, to technology as a teaching, for those that are chalkboard uh, educators, uh, if you will, um, I don't think this is a big lift. Uh, it's, it's an easy thing. It, it builds on stuff I'm sure you're already doing in some ways. Um, and it, it'll help you in the digital space and, and also maybe bring in some, some digital pieces that will help ways that you've already been teaching for a while. Not asking you to change the way you teach uh, by adopting hypothesis. I think it can help the way you are already teaching. Um, I used to hand out this poem just to show how old school I am and how old school annotation is. I used to hand out this poem by Billy Collins the first day of class when I taught English uh, and composition um, as, a, as a really try to, try to in, inspire my students to write in the margins of their books. We have all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen if only to show we do not just laze in an armchair turning pages, we press the thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. For those that read up on, you know, education theory, you know, social, uh, it's not social learning, but active learning, right, active reading, this is what Billy Collins is talking about, right, not just uh, skimming over the pages, but investing some of your energy, uh, intellectual energy into the book as you read to really try to comprehend it, but also to develop your analyses uh, about about the words on the page and bring something to class if you're gonna have a class discussion or make notes that will then be harvested later as part of some summative assignment like a paper uh, or you know, mark it up so that you can take a, a reading quiz on it uh, the next day. Um, probably not a shocker as a sort of you know, educational technique here. Um, and it, it's been around really since the invention of the book, this idea of writing the margins. Those of you that are scholars as well as educators know we've been writing in books since the invention of the book, if not earlier. Uh, adding our thoughts in the side, in the side there, in the, in the white space, you know, um, bringing in context, uh, focusing our thoughts around the text in, in marginalia. Um, but we lose this ability to write in the margins a lot of the time when we start to deliver content online, uh, which people have been doing already and, and maybe more so uh, now that we're not going to the campus bookstore. This is what annotation looks like in the digital age. Uh, it retains some of the features that one would expect from you know, analog paper annotation. You can still have your personal marginal notes in the margin of a in the, in the sidebar of a text, um, but you can also perhaps see a public layer of annotation where folks from across the world or across the country uh, can be collaborating on a particular document, something in the news, for example. Um, and you can have any number of private groups that are formed around a text, communities really, that are formed around the reading of the text. You might have the community of your colleagues. When I taught uh, composition at UT, we used to all teach the same text for freshman comp. We'd all have the same base text. And so hundreds of students across the, uh, across the university, uh, dozens of, of uh, instructors across the university were all reading the same text. This is a way that I think it would have been helpful for me and my colleagues in composition to talk about how we're gonna teach this book, um, to have a private sort of teacher layer to talk about the book. And then of course we could have had, uh, in addition to that, any number of private layers for our individual course groups. Before we hear from the experts, I just wanna highlight sort of three ways that instructors and students uh, that uh, I've worked with over the years have helped me to start to think about the power of collaborative annotation and social reading and hypothesis in particular um, in their teaching and learning. The first is again, nothing new, hypothesis, makes reading active. Lawrence Hanley, uh, wonderful guy at San Francisco State University, 
I want students to learn the profits and pleasures of careful engaged reading, to cultivate this kind of reading and learning. I've tried a lot of previous annotation tools, but Hypothesis finally delivers on the promise of digital annotation. For those in the humanities, this is probably nothing new. We, we want this out of our, our students. But I've learned also over the, over the recent years that this idea of close reading, of paying close attention to textual evidence, of grounding claims and textual evidence isn't really something restricted to the humanities, right? This is something that across the disciplines is incredibly valuable as students uh, enter into college uh, you know, level education and need to start to pay closer attention to the text that they're studying and ground claims in the text that they're studying and bring quotes into uh, other you know, uh, assignments that, that, that they do. Um, one way that hypothesis and collaborative orientation make reading active in new ways though is of course you can add memes like in the screen grab from, from Larry's course uh, where students were using memes to annotate a poem. And in fact, he actually, this assignment was all visual annotation. Uh, students were, were prompted to just find an image and annotate the poem with the image or annotate a line in the poem uh, with the image. This one I think is new though. As I said, I used to hand out the, the Collins poem and tell my students to annotate, but really it was five weeks later that I evaluated them on that practice. Whether they did it, whether they did it well, I'd look at a paper and see how they integrated textual evidence and whether their analysis was grounded well in the text. Um, and I'd grade them then, five weeks later after asking them to, do the, to perform this task um, and never give them feedback about it really or never train them in how to do it um, and never help them do it. Um, and collaborative orientation makes it possible to see how students are reading, um, to make what I think is largely an invisible space, you know, how are students reading? We see how they write, right? We get evidence of that but we really see how they read and this kind of technology makes it possible to see that space and I think opens up a, a you know, vast area for, for teaching and, and, uh, and for uh, the learning sciences as well. This is Linda Parsons at Ohio State. She's an education professor, so we should listen to her. Their hypothesis annotations give me a window to their thoughts and understandings that I couldn't access otherwise. I wouldn't get this depth of interaction in a standard discussion forum. And it's true that I think uh, hypothesis can be seen both as additive to, but sometimes replacing the discussion form in a sense of really grounding um, the conversation in a text and really allowing any number of discussions to blossom specifically uh, from a text, whether they're teacher driven or student driven. And finally, hypothesis makes reading social. And this is a quote from Shannon Griffiths, a student of Robin DeRosa, shout, shout out to Robin uh, at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. Uh, and this is from a while, a while back, but I hold on to this quote with, with dear life. Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this brilliant tool, I know I'm not alone. And this goes back to that idea of, of community, right? And it's certainly something I would have loved to have as a student myself in graduate school when I was encountering, you know, Derrida or somebody like that for the first time and being like, you know, WTF, I, I have no idea what's going on here. And I'd like to know that my classmates also were ha having that experience and I'd like to have been able to work with them to get through that. Of course, I, I did do the work to get through that and that sort of individual effort is, is valuable, but to, to share the responsibility, you know, there's plenty in Derrida, uh, you know, writing to, to share and have everybody sort of work on their own to, to elucidate a passage um, and then share each other's elucidations to get through, the, uh, to get through more of it together. Um, so of course, hypothesis makes reading social. And this is that you know, leveraging of the, uh, of the sort of network culture that we live in. Um, normally annotations have been largely private. They still can be online, but we also have this ability to share our first encounters with the text, uh, to share the ways that we're thinking through a text with our classmates and instructors can be there to, to see that um, and to intervene whether uh, to, to course correct if a student is confused uh, or to inspire if a student has found some thread that's, that's worth investigating elsewhere. Oh, I guess I have one more section before I turn it over to the experts. Uh, just to give you a picture, some of you may know about Hypothesis. I'd be curious if the chat is, uh, is telling us a little bit about who's new and, and who, who has known about Hypothesis for a while. But when our tool is activated on top of a digital document, it's quite simple. You highlight text and you can create an annotation. That annotation can be private, only me, or it can be public, shared to the world, or it can be shared to a specific pri private group that you create or you're a part of. Um, you can reply to any annotation, and this is really key for those that I'm gonna turn around and bring this into a course, I think. Depending on, on how you plan to use uh, annotation in your course, the reply feature and encouraging replies in students is a key piece. 
right? Because if it is about discussion for you, if it is about the discursive connection between students, then uh, you really want to highlight hi replies and maybe build it into your assignment so that you have those nice threaded discussions around a specific piece of text. That's one of the most powerful things I've seen in my use of hypothesis uh, with students for sure. Um, and you can also share annotations. You can actually share annotations that are uh, private inside of a LMS implementation, um, but public annotations can be shared and then, and then linked to uh, in powerful ways uh, on the web. I mentioned annotating in groups. And then you can search your notes. Of course, I don't have like a nice scholarly bookshelf behind me. I should, I need to reorient my COVID uh, video conferencing environment to have that nice, you know, expert bookshelf behind me like you see on, the, on PBS when they interview a professor. Um, but all those books have highlights in them, maybe sticky notes, but I have to go and sort of haptically figure out, well, where is that passage in, the Gats in Gatsby? I know that I, I marked it up, but I still have to find it. And that haptic piece is, is important and valuable, but one of the cool things about digital annotation is that all your notes are digitized, all the annotations are digitized, all the original content is digitized, so you can search through your, your archive of annotations and then leverage them in powerful ways um, out, you know, beyond the, the moment of encountering the text. Again, I've, I've embedded some resources here throughout that might be useful to folks if you're gonna turn around and try to implement hypothesis in the classroom. Okay, I guess I have one more section. I need to look ahead to where I'm, I'm turning it over to the experts, but it's gonna happen soon. Um, for those that are, uh, are thinking about turning around and implementing hypothesis, the bottom line is get in touch with us, support at hypothesis or Jeremy Dean at hypothesis. Lots of ways to reach out. I'll, I'll highlight them later. You can make meetings with us. There are resources online. We'll have other, we have office hours now to help teachers get up and running. But there are basically three ways to activate hypothesis on top of a text. I think the easiest uh, from the student and teacher perspective is the LMS integration. Some of you may be faculty to school and don't have the power to add hypothesis to your LMS. We can work with you uh, on that. If your admins are, are open to the idea, we have all the documentation in place and we can make it easy on our end to get up and running within the LMS. It's an easy integration, but this step may require you to talk to a local uh, campus LMS uh, admin to get up and running. But it will in the end be the easiest way for students to get up and running because they won't be creating accounts, uh, they won't be signing in, uh, they won't be figuring out how to turn on this powerful uh, you know, annotation layer on top of the text. It'll all be done for them in the LMS. They'll open a PDF and there's this annotation sidebar as you can see uh, in the image. So this is the easiest way if we can do it. Um, we do have browser extensions that allow you to add a, a, a sort of tool to your, to your browser and then turn annotation on as you visit different documents that you want to annotate. Um, I imagine some of you might not know what a browser extension is. <laughs> uh, and so that's why this is a little bit of a harder lift for you. Um, you may know what a browser extension is, but you're not interested in getting 50 undergrads uh, through a Zoom ha Hangout to learn what a browser extension is and add it to the various different uh, browsers that they might be working on that are at different stages of being updated, right? Um, so, but this is possible if you don't have access to the LMS app to get, browse, uh, get a browser extension and add it to your browser and, and lead th students through that. We do have tutorials around how to do that. Um, so this is the best option for what we call in the wild use uh, outside the, the walled garden of the LMS uh, is the wild usage. And, and this is the best uh, option there. Uh, Chrome and Bookmark uh, and, uh, and Firefox are the optimal browsers there. Um, and then finally, we do have something that's not showing up, that's too bad. Um, we do have a, a paste a link option my image isn't showing up here, we'll get it into the deck. Um, but we do have a, if you go to via, V-I-A dot hypothesis with the I dot before the I-S, um, it's a Google-like interface where you can enter a URL and it will share a new URL with, um, with uh, hypothesis added. Um, it'll only work for public web pages, but it is a quick and easy way. I could go grab a, an article from CNN right now, drop it in the chat, you would be able to open it up and immediately be able to, uh, to annotate it. Um, if you had an account. More on all that stuff later. I guess I have more sections. I keep saying I'm gonna go to the experts, but I'm gonna move through this very quickly and then pass it on to the, to the experts and then we'll have a conversation. Um, hypothesis in the classroom. This is five ways and I'm gonna move through it quickly. It's in the deck and we're gonna hear from, from uh, Amanda, Kat and Mike uh, soon to, to hear about how they've used it at their institutions. But five ways that I've been thinking about hypothesis in this era where a lot of folks who are new to online teaching uh, are, are figuring out how to do it. Um, one is that I've always thought of this as a sort of 
secondary benefit of hypothesis because I'm, you know, the English professor, close reading, right? Um, that's, the, that's the number one thing. But I remember hearing from a UT professor many years ago who was using our tool in, in a history classroom. And she said, oh, she was doing primary source reading, so obviously very valuable to have an annotation tool. But she said, really, the thing that was cool about it was the community, the way that it built community in my classroom, the way that it bonded the students together, and they were able to work together to build knowledge and collaborate. Um, because they, they transfer that to classroom behavior, they transfer that to other group uh, activities that weren't annotation based, but they had learned through hypothesis to work together in that way as a powerful thing. And then in this era when we're not getting together face to face, I think that's all the more important. For those that are new and still a little scared despite the meditation at the beginning and, and all my assurances, um, you can just enable hypothesis on your texts and see what students do. You're turning on a valuable you know, space. You're opening the margin on digital text that where it's not really possible to write anymore. And you're creating a social space for them to interact. They may be asking each other questions. Depending on the level that you're teaching, this is a way to um, you know, easily add hypothesis without too much uh, preparation on your part. Another thing to do, and this happens a lot at, at earlier levels of education, is to just uh, to annotate yourself to be a guide through the texts that are now online. I was thinking this is something that really a lot of us, at least in the humanities, spend our classes doing. And I saw a professor of the classics, I think at Xavier University, I saw her in a group in our, in our sort of data feed. She was just one, prof one active user in the group, but hundreds of annotations. I was like, what is this person doing? And I saw what, what, what the, the course was, a classics course, and it was clear to me that you know, this is what, you know, I imagine a Greek professor does when they're in class. They go through a text very, uh, line word by word and talk about conjugations. I never took Latin or anything like that. Um, but they're talking about very specific pieces of text and that's something that you do in class and you can't now. Um, and this is something, you know, we can do now uh, asynchronously with, with hypotheses, is, um, add annotations to a text for our students. I think I've covered the idea that this can replace or not replace, but this can bring a seminar kind of style conversation to, to uh, your online class. You may meet uh, in Zoom uh, as part of your, what, your new life uh, online teaching. But this is an asynchronous way to work through the text and have something to base that face-to-face -face Zoom conversation on. And then finally, for those that teach lecture courses, I think it would be really interesting to add a PDF of your, um, of your lecture notes or a slide deck that's got optical characters in it and allow students to annotate there. And then you can see where they're, they might be confused in your lectures um, and intervene and have your teaching assistants help students through the text. All right, guest educators are experts. I'm gonna turn it over to them now. I think we're gonna start with Amanda. Thank you guys so much for being here. Sorry to go on for so long. The, the floor you. is yours. Hi, I'm Amanda LaCastro. Can everyone hear me? Just, uh, present other panelists, great. <laughs> okay, so I'm from Stevenson University in Baltimore, Maryland. It is a small, um, university that is very career driven and we really do focus on small class sizes and face-to-face -face learning so this transition to teaching online has been um, difficult for our students i've actually been using hypothesis since 2016 i gave my first presentation on hypothesis at the society for textual studies in 2016 so my students have been using this for a long time and i'm hoping to share kind of some of what works for me in my class. I'm going to attempt now to share my screen with you. Um, so give me a minute and let's see if this works. All right, everyone nod if you can see these slides. <laughs> okay, <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Um, okay, so first and foremost, I don't like to pick a tool and then design an assignment around it. I like to think about my learning objectives and then find a tool that meets those learning objectives. So what is one of the foundational learning objectives that I want my students to be able to do, whether it be a 100 level composition course or a 400 level um, media history or literature course, I want them to be able to read deeply and closely what Jeremy was calling active reading but do it in a way where they're learning from each other, where they're hearing from uh, 
collaboration of, of difference, which is a term from Kathy Davidson, meaning that the more experiences and the more diversity you bring to a conversation or a problem, the more, um, the more depth you're going to get to your solutions. So I want students to be learning from each other in a way that um, allows their conversations to exist without my explicit facilitation or even interjection. And while we can have that through group work in the face-to-face -face classroom, I find that a lot of students um, engage in this better in an online space where they have the asynchronous time to think through their thoughts, to think through their contributions, and then also take that time in responding to each other. So that's what brought me to social annotation, is this, um, how do I get students to read deeply and actively with each other, kind of without me? <laughs> because we know that we're not going to cover all of the texts we assign in the classroom space. If I assign three articles or three poems or three short stories, I'm not gonna be able to go through every single line of all of those texts in the classroom space. So I want to, to be able to see where students were struggling and I wanted to be able to see if students were reading, right? The big question, like are students doing the reading um, in a real way. So I experimented with a lot of different tools and ended up with hypothesis for a lot of reasons I'll discuss in a minute. I am actually a scholar of media history. I study uh, book history. And for me, it's really important to historicize social annotation for my students and actually for other faculty members who are interested in using um, annotation software. We are all familiar with annotating a book, like Jeremy said, but what we might not know is that in the history of annotation, most marginalia were actually meant for a public audience, not for that kind of internal audience that we assume people are annotating for now in the 21st century. And one way I demonstrate this is through the Book Traces project. So Book Traces is a project out of UVA that is collecting marginalia on pre-1923 texts, specifically looking at how um, 19th century readers annotated texts. And this uh, website that you're seeing, booktraces.org, is a huge archive of all of these texts that people have found in the circulating stacks at universities all over the world. Uh, students can actually go into libraries, use a very simple mobile application to find annotations in copies of 19th century texts, and then they digitize them, um, write data uh, notes about them, and upload them to this site. Um, I believe that Book Traces is actually up to almost 6,000 examples of this. So now when you can't have students physically go to your library and look for examples of annotations, they can just go to the site right here and pull up all of these historical examples of uh, readers um, across time and across the world using marginalia to talk to each other. Um, not only are these examples full of people speaking to their lovers or their friends or their family members or their communities through the margins, they're also annotating multimodally. So you'll find examples of drawings, of pressed flowers, of locks of hair, of swatches of fabric, all sorts of interesting multimodal annotations that give a history and provenance to the kind of work that I'm then shifting to the digital space um, in my classroom. So students understand that they're entering this kind of long tail of social annotation, that it's not just this new fangled tool that I'm um, kind of thrusting upon them. That reading was always a social practice and those annotations were always meant to be shared. You can see that my students actually picked this up really easily from this quote from a student here. This uh, sophomore Ryan Roche is talking about how the notes he found on the Book Traces um, website actually reminded him of email, <laughs> right? So emails back and forth between people um, and that he really understood that it was very much like a historical example of modern communication. Go back to Kathy Davidson, one of the reasons I think this tool is so important right now is what Kathy Davidson talks about in terms of productive multitasking. We are all multitasking at this moment, right? I have a two-year-old running around in the background of my house. I'm sure all of you have some other distractions happening in your world right now, and my students absolutely certainly do and have expressed that clearly. They're also very distracted. Now that all of their work has moved online, we have notifications and pop-ups and websites and chats and all of the other things dashing across our screens. So to think about how to use multitasking and distraction productively to actually 
use that to learn. This text is a really wonderful example of that. And that's what I try to do by showing them how they can annotate texts online to kind of use the idea of a pop-up or a distraction or a conversation to learn more about the text rather than taking them away from the text. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples now. This first one is from a 100 level first year writing class. So these are first year students that you're seeing actively learning here. And yes, I do have their permission to share this with you. Um, so this is an article about reading on screens versus reading on paper. So very meta activity here. And you can see that on the margins, um, my students are not only annotating almost line by line, if not word for word on this document, but they're also responding to each other and they're using multimodal elements to respond. So to set up this assignment, I just take the website, put it in to Hypothesis, either using the standalone site or using the LMS plugin, which my university just adopted. And I give students very, very, very basic instructions. I ask them at the beginning to do three annotations um, and uh, one reply, and then as we move through the course, I up the ante to five annotations and two replies, then eight annotations and three replies as a minimum. They almost always do far more than the minimum that I've expressed, but it's just to ease that anxiety of knowing the requirements. And then I give them a list of kinds of annotations that they might do. One is looking up references with citations and links. The other is defining terms. One is providing opinions with evidence. Another one is to link to other resources or to connect to other resources from our class or another class. And finally, to um, ask questions. So they have those guidelines, but otherwise they're free to do kind of whatever they want. And you can tell those are very open ended guidelines. This particular example I wanted to show because you can see that my students are linking videos and images and all sorts of other resources from each other. And you can see that they're really having very robust conversations, uh, lots of replies, agreeing and disagreeing with each other, using direct quotes from the text um, as kind of the launch point of those conversations. This next example um, is actually from an upper level course, an upper level course that happens to be on digital publishing. So I was thinking about how do we talk about digital publishing, the future of digital publishing. What's really interesting about this is that um, because it is an upper level course, I've moved away from the private space that you saw in the first year example where they're, they were only annotating for each other within that class to the public sphere. So when I do this for upper level students who've already had experience in a private space is I then choose an article I know has annotations from the general public and I kind of unleash them to engage with the public outside of our classroom. You can see in the annotations here that students are really having a like a debate <laughs> about one of the definitions and one of the um, uh, that one student posted. They're having a really in-depth debate here over um, uh, a, a term that's being used. And if you look at that very last annotation by Lynette Bagley, you can see that she is bringing in material from her theory and criticism course, that other English course she's mentioning. She's bringing in the theory and criticism from another English class that is not taught by me, <laughs> right? And, and sharing it with her fellow students, which as an educator, that's exactly what we want to happen, right? Like that's the synergy and synthesis that we crave in a class where students are making those connections across different classes they're taking. This is an example of how I use social annotation for an individual assignment. So this is a rhetorical analysis assignment. I have stud students perform a rhetorical analysis of a text using hypothesis. In this example here, the student is identifying genre, audience, author, context, et cetera, in an essayistic form using the annotations. And as you can see from Elena Stegg's annotations there on the right, she's actually bringing in a lot of quotes from the other texts we've read in this class. So we read Joanna Drucker's graphesis, and you, she, you see she's quoting it right there. Um, about hypertexts and how about this is a version of hypertexts. Again, exactly the kind of work we want to see from students is those making connections across texts. So one thing that um, I have found is that hypothesis is really good to use in conjunction with other tools that you are already using or maybe already familiar with. Um, studies have shown and I have um, all these studies linked actually uh, um, in the blog post that's shared at the end 
And the, these studies have actually showed that hypothesis, because students can engage line by line with the text, have showed a considerable, um, considerably more um, grounded <laughs> um, conversations about the text, whereas the Blackboard discussion posts tends to extrapolate, right, tends to generalize about a text and is less specific um, than of the hypothesis tool. So what I've done to bridge that gap is I actually use both. I will start students by annotating a text in hypothesis and then as a follow-up assign them a provocation on a discussion board post where they're finding just one scene or one small chunk of that text to then synthesize and, and ask the question about to ground further conversation. That kind of step-by-step -step process ends with a multimodal essay on the text, which capitalizes on all of those skills they've learned in um, a higher stakes version. One thing that this really, really, really has shown me that I didn't expect, kind of a, an unexpected benefit of this process, is that when students don't highlight a section of a text, when a section of a text has no annotations on it, that is what I teach. That's where I use my face-to-face -face time to explain, let's see why no one annotated this section of the text. Were you perhaps confused or intimidated by this section of the text? Why did no one choose to write their provocation on this section of the text? And that's where I get to use my face-to-face -face time or your Zoom time, right, more effectively. So I'm just going to point you to the book chapter where I explain this in a lot greater depth. I'm happy to send you a pre-publication version if you can't get a copy. Um, and of course, you can always email me or um, ask me questions on Twitter. Thank you so much. Great. I think we'll, let's hear from Kat King next from Diablo Valley College. Uh, just a brief introduction. I'm uh, Kat King. I'm an instructional technologist at Diablo Valley College, a, a community college in California. Um, I've been joking that if I look a little wild eyed, it's because we are on the semester system. And so right in the middle of the semester, uh, we suddenly had to create a plan and move all of our face to face and hybrid classes into a fully online format. And um, I'm sure you can imagine it was a big lift and it is an ongoing lift. And um, I thought I'd talk a little bit today about, you know, where I see hypothesis fitting in for all of us in this moment, um, how I use hypothesis as an English instructor in my own classes and sort of why why I'm interested in it in general too. Um, uh, one of the trends I've noticed as we all tried to kind of wrap our head around this sudden shift to remote learning is that um, I think in a desire to keep some normalcy for our students, a lot of instructors have wanted to kind of mimic the kind of synchronous meetings they're used to having with students. So what I mean by that is like if I taught a class that was a Tuesday, Thursday class that met from 10 to 11, 15 a.m., my instinct was to say, okay, I've got this remote thing. I'm going to get trained on Zoom and then I'm just going to teach my classes via video conference on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 to 11, 15. Um, there's one kind of way I want people to pause and think about that. And that is we are now in like a totally different world. Um, for example, if I was a student and signed up for that Tuesday, Thursday, 10 o'clock class in the beginning of the spring, I knew that, you know, I could commit to showing up to class on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 o'clock. Um, things have, the ground has sort of been swept out from under us. Right now, I have my two children at home, uh, ages six and eight. And so I'm working with their teachers to try to, you know, homeschool my children while uh, the K-12 schools are closed. And our students often have uh, children of their own or younger brothers and sisters that are suddenly in the house and people are sharing computers and spaces and things are um, very cozy. I have students who are nurses or work in grocery stores that have suddenly seen their, um, their hours at work double. 
for really good reasons. Um, I have other students who have suddenly been laid off and are food insecure, right? And so for, for many compelling reasons, there are, um, we may have students in our classes that suddenly that Tuesday, Thursday from 10 to 11, 15 time slot isn't kind of, isn't such a sure thing. And the danger of, you know, hosting all of our classes via Zoom is that we can begin to leave students out of the conversation. Um, so then one of the things I'm attracted to about hypothesis in this moment is um, kind of is, is bringing some equity to this situation. If I assign a reading to my students, um, I could assign a reading on Tuesday and ask students to read it and annotate it you know, by Thursday, or, you know, I could give them a couple, a couple of days, in which case now, like for me, a lot of my work is happening at, from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. when my, when my kids are in bed, right? And so students are able to still engage and be an active part of the conversation without, um, you know, being penalized for this kind of crazy new world we're in, where suddenly our, all of our schedules are in flux. Um, and so now, you know, we can provide some sort of asynchronous and remote some support to students and give our students the opportunity to connect with each other um, without being tied so specifically by, by timeframes. Um, equity is a big reason I was interested in hypothesis in the first place. Uh, even before this, I was leading a pilot of hypothesis at Diablo Valley College, and I teach at Las Positas College too, and we've been exploring the idea of a, of a pilot there. Um, we have integrated hypothesis within Canvas, which is our learning management system, and so I'd be happy to kind of speak to that later, but um, uh, I guess one of the reasons I was really interested in doing this pilot before COVID-19 is um, because I have this personal connection to uh, dyslexia. So dyslexia runs rampant in my family, and I think it's an under-talked about issue in education. Um, you know, just to kind of briefly give like the 20 second, you know, presentation on that. Dyslexia is a, a neurobiological, diff, you know, brain-based difference that makes reading a really legitimate and time-consuming struggle. Um, it's the most common learning disability. It, um, the, Estimates suggest, so um, this is from the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. It is the most common of all neurocognitive disorders affecting up to 20% of the population. So if like me, you may have skipped some math classes in favor of the humanities, we're talking, you know, maybe one in five of our students uh, dealing with dyslexia. It's often diagnosed. My background is in K-12, and to sound a little bit cynical here for a minute, it isn't necessarily in a K-12 school's best interest to diagnose a student with dyslexia, because if a student has a formal diagnosis, a school is then obligated to provide appropriate support, and that costs money. And so what happens is a lot of students with dyslexia never get a formal diagnosis. They don't necessarily know that they have dyslexia and they show up in our community college classrooms um, with, you know, the sense of imposter syndrome. They perhaps feel like they're, they're dumb. They don't get it. They, they worry a bit about being there. Um, and then the problem uh, is that, especially as we make the shift to online, a lot of our classes become very heavy text-based. And uh, reading is really this thing that takes place in isolation, right? So if I'm teaching and I send my students home with a reading, 
they go home with that book and by themselves have to kind of figure it out. Um, if you sent me home with a book in French, right, and said, read this, read this book in, in French, I could sit there and, and, you know, work at it and try to figure it out. But pretty soon I'm going to get frustrated and I'm going to give up because I, I just not that skilled in French. Right. And so, um, so one of the things that I think is really powerful about hypothesis is it allows us to send students uh, home with a sort of social support system. Um, instructors, we as instructors can pre-annotate a text for students. So I could say, hey, I know people are going to struggle with this concept and I'm going to go in ahead of time. So when a student is at home reading something, they are going to kind of See my little pop up there, right? And and a great thing about an uh, hypothesis is annotations do not have to be text based, so you don't necessarily have to just layer on additional reading, right? I can choose to annotate via image, via you know a YouTube video or a TED Talk video, uh, audio. I can link out to a podcast that explains some concept that I know is difficult, and so. Um, I can also right, really leverage my classroom community. So in any given class, we're gonna have strong readers. Great, now my strongest readers are gonna be really modeling powerful reading strategies for my you know, emerging readers or my students who struggle with reading, right? Because now I can kind of see, oh, um, you know, Jenny said this thing about this part of the text that really explained it for me in a in a you know easier way so um but also you know our students with dyslexia or some kind of reading disabilities it's it's not a sign of low intelligence right um these are some of our strongest critical thinkers um aaron brockovich is dyslexic walt disney uh charles schwab uh you know there's there's so Albert Einstein, right? So it's not necessarily like our students who aren't strong readers can't be adding things to the conversation. And now you're giving, um, you know, other students the chance to model their really powerful critical thinking skills or their ability to see things a little bit differently. And so really uh, using this social digital annotation gives all of our students the chance to kind of shine and do their thing, right? Everybody can build off of each other. And so um, uh, just a couple of quick tips, because I know a lot of us are really thinking like practical in this moment. So some things that we've noticed from our pilot and you know, colleagues that are using this tool in the classroom right now is um, be specific when you're rolling out digital annotation. And so for me, um, that meant like if I wanted my students to annotate a text, I might be really specific about quantity, right? So add three annotations because otherwise you might have one student who adds one annotation and another who like adds 470, right? So kind of setting some expectations there. Um, I talked to my students when I introduced the um, concept of annotation about like, well, what do your teachers mean when they tell you to annotate something? Because sometimes students think, oh, you just want me to highlight the crap out of something. Um, and studies show that, you know, just simple highlighting is not as effective. And so, you know, you can give students some, um, you know, some, some tips there, right? Like, hey, why didn't you ask the author or ask a classmate or ask the instructor a question or go in and reply to someone else's um, question. You could ask students to, uh, hey, tag the thesis in this essay or, you know, tag a theme and really track themes that way. And um, it gives the instructor a quick snapshot to see like where are students getting things or where are they getting lost. Um, you can ask students to make comparisons, right? Can you hyperlink out to 
something going on in the world right now or another class reading. Um, and you can ask students to make, you know, connections. A lot of students are willing to share some really personal connections to readings and that becomes this powerful for, sort of bonding moment in the classroom. Um, so I am happy to talk to people about um, our process of getting that pilot run up uh, together and you know other materials that we've you know crowdsourced through that but i do want to make sure we have time to hear from michael today um who's gonna uh you know share some of his unique perspective with us so i'm gonna stop my share now and pass over the mic thanks kat yeah all right mike you're on all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm Mike Goudsred from Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, and um, I'm I'm going to do something I haven't uh, previewed with Jeremy. So we'll see how this goes. I'm going to talk about a different annotation tool uh, as part of my journey with annotation. Um, so <clears throat> I will share my screen here, uh, and I think successfully. So you now see. An edX course, is that right, panelists? Yeah, great. Um, so a few years ago, I worked on a MOOC, um, an edX platform on 19th century American literature. It included seven authors, I think, uh, and <clears throat> particularly exploring their connection to our college. So all of them had were connected in some way. Um, and it was a really long reading list. Um, we, we probably uh, did a lot of things that you're told not to do in MOOCs. Um, so we really wanted to think about how uh, students would be um, interacting with texts in an online context. And uh, so we used Lacuna Stories at the time. It was a uh, project out of Stanford. Um, great tool. Uh, so it, it even has some things that I think Hypothesis is thinking about having, like analytics and threading together um, uh, annotations. Um, it, it worked really well because we were uh, working with 19th century text, so we had uh, all uh, public domain copies of everything. And um, one of the things that was really revealing is that students interacted with the content in different ways. So we saw people who were very um, active in the discussion boards. We were also trying another tool there. Uh, we saw some people who uh, submitted all the assignments. Um, and then we saw people who were avid annotators. They showed up not in the discussions or, and they didn't do the assignments, but they were just annotating. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's one, that's kind of the first stop on my annotation train. Uh, and I asked Nate to put a link in the chat for you. Um, this should be an archive mode. You should still be able to sign up for it at, in uh, edX. And there's also some other, if you wanted to see um, some examples of assignments related to annotation, I'll say the, the tool no longer works. So um, if you're looking for a live working Lacuna Stories, sorry. The next I wanted to talk about, and this is Hypothesis, um, was a MOOC on uh, using the Milton Reading Room. And some of you may be aware of the Milton Reading Room project at Dartmouth. I think it's um, near 20 years old now. It's a digital text. And so the, the MOOC was just a portal into that space and we added the layer of, um, of hypothesis over it. And so over the last 20 years, it's been annotated um, by students and, uh, and, and others, um, but we wanted to sort of put a social layer over that. And that works pretty well. Um, at the time we put it on the site, I think if we were doing it again, we would use the LTI in uh, in edX. So um, I've been talking to a friend who works in another industry and they're uh, experiencing a lot of change and shifts. And so he said they, t they start every Monday by talking about the truth of the moment. So I'm just gonna talk about the truth of the moment. And this is probably small t truth, um, but um, Thinking about hypothesis from an in institutional perspective, uh, we were um, in the good good situation of being in an active pilot with hypothesis. So I'll say a lot of security review and testing had happened, and we had a few uh, eager um, pilot participants. 
Um, but we've gotten a lot more interest in the last couple of days. <clears throat> we are a quarter institution, or we're on the quarter system, so our spring quarter will start next Monday. Um, liberal arts institution, and we've had uh, a, a big response from people from all different disciplines. So uh, thankfully, Jeremy was willing to sort of respond to my crazy pitch of like, let's just get a workshop together. Um, we made the call of like, let's uh, make it as familiar as possible to what students will be seeing so faculty can experience that. So we put together a Canvas site, installed Hypothesis, and then also invited one, um, uh, one of the pilot members to talk about uh, how he had used uh, excuse me, how he had used hypothesis with his students. And that's been really successful. People are kind of off and running. Um, we'll see next week when we launch uh, the spring term. Um, but I, I wanted to offer, you know, if anyone is in the situation where they need to have those conversations or uh, a security review with your IT department, we'd be happy to share th that those materials if it will save you some time. So uh, I think I, you know, Jeremy, unless you have any questions for me, <clears throat> I'll uh, leave it there. Great. Thank you all. Uh, snap of the fingers to, to, for your presentations today and for your long time uh, work with Hypothesis. Uh, really appreciate everything that you guys have done uh, in collaboration with us and especially today. Really valuable different uh, points of view that I think are going to inform folks um, who are listening in, uh, both, you know, veterans and and uh, rookies to the collaborative annotation space. So thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Mike. Um, we are coming up upon the hour. Um, I think Amanda, Kat, and Mike's information is somewhere in this deck, and we can tweet it out. I'm going to send a tweet in just a second about this. Uh, they're, they're resources for you, obviously. Amanda's published widely. Kat's ideas about how this can be used, as, as, and, and especially the California Community Colleges, have been a real inspiration for me, and we've seen tremendous growth in that movement. Um, and as, as Mike mentioned, I think he's a great resource for the institutional, as is Kat, uh, institutional partnership. And we are available to help your institution get up and running. Uh, I hope you are seeing a slide here. I'm going to cut my presentation short so we're finished on the hour. Um, but I just wanted to uh, point to some places to keep the conversation going. We're currently hosting office hours. If you were inspired today, you want to take the step forward, whether it's a pedagogical question. I saw people had questions about what do I do with my institution? We can work with you. We can work with your LMS admin to get up and running as quickly as, as, as possible. Um, so come to our office hours. We also have lots of self-service uh, guides at, in, in our help documents um, that you can go in and check out, both for getting started in the wild, as it were, or in the LMS. Some of you may have the ability to install in an LMS at university, and you'll be able to get started maybe without us. Um, and then finally, you can set up one-to-one uh, -one meetings with us uh, to, to talk about any of this. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining today. Thank you to the panelists especially. Thank you to Nate Angel, my colleague, for, uh, for his help on putting this together. Um, and hang in there. We're here for you. If Hypothesis can help, if I can help, if Collaborative Annotation can help you and your students and your uh, instructors and colleagues, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. That's what we're 100% focused on. Thanks, everybody.